some, you know, programming features, I would say a buffer of 100% is fairly reasonable. <laughs> so, you know, that's true. That's true. You know, if a, if, if a programmer tells you they're going to, it's going to take you one week to do it, like assume that it's going to take two. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not even a joke I, I either. Think, like that. No. And, and I'm not being flippant, like, yeah. And I'm not saying that programmers are lazy or they don't no. know how to estimate. It's just that it's extremely difficult to, estimate mm. programming tasks <laughs> welcome everyone to a new episode of the zero to play podcast i'm your host carla duke and today i'm joined by masao kobayashi masao is a co-founder of cut to bits an indie studio formed by several AAA industry veterans based in montreal he has experience working at ubisoft for over 13 years where he worked through at least seven different positions from translation to production today we'll be talking about his journey through games what it was like working for such a large company for so long and why he left and production advice for managing tight deadlines and efficient teams. So sit back, relax and enjoy episode nine of season four of the Zero to Play podcast. And welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm uh, very excited to be on your podcast. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think I've spoken to someone who's had so many different roles within the same company. A lot of people that I've, I've spoken to that are, you know, veterans in the industry have, you know, stuck to the kind of the same role. And I love how your journey has kind of taken you through all these different departments from uh, like localization, community management and like production. Uh, so I'm really curious to know like what that kind of whole journey was like um so uh, we're going to go through kind of your past and and how you got into games and and how that like ubisoft journey happened uh but i kind of want to start with cut to bits and uh you're you're working on an unannounced project uh, i'd love to know like what what was the 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 reason for wanting to to leave um you know such a big company and and partner up with uh with other co-founders to to make something in the in the indie space what was what was the reason that made you want to do that um, why did I want to go to India? Uh, so, um, that's a complicated question. <laughs> uh, I didn't have, uh, particularly any indie aspiration. Like I'm not, uh, I was never, you know, I was never a person that was in AAA that really wished that they were indie instead. Mm -hmm. Uh, it just kind of happened. Um, so the creative director for uh, our company, uh, Paul Green, um, uh, he was the one that approached me to say, uh, to ask me if I was interested in uh, uh, co-founding a studio with him. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, I was kind of feeling like I had hit a rut at Ubisoft. Yeah. So I was looking into other opportunities. I was looking at other studios. I was looking at possibly even other industries. I have, I, I know some people who work in VFX, which is, uh, which is common in Montreal as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I was thinking about that as a possibility. And yeah, when Paul approached me, I thought, you know, this, this is a, this is a new challenge and it sounds quite exciting. So I, you know, we, we we quit the <laughs> quit yeah. Ubisoft together and uh, founded the studio together. Well, I, a lot of people that I've spoken about that I've had like if you write it on paper, it sounds like a similar journey. But they they usually you know developers that have like an indie idea that they quit their job to pursue. Whereas I feel like this is maybe more of like a structured approach to to going indie, a bit more of like a maybe a strategic thing. Because uh, because one thing that that gets brought up is like the money. Like how do you pay the bills if you if you go indie? Um, is that all kind of secured? Uh, you don't have to go into like any detail but like is there a lot of risk with the decision that you're making in terms of hoping that you have a success or is there quite a lot of backing from the very beginning um well i i think uh, with indie it really depends on who you ask uh people's circumstances are very different i know people who like quit their job and you know kind of work on savings or mm -hmm. they have, uh, you know, family or friends that invest in them. And that allows them to kind of create the initial, you know, initial demo that then they go shop around. Uh, in our case, uh, our company is um, 
uh, had investors uh, from the beginning. We had um, we had equity investors that were interested in what we had to do, mm-hmm. and uh, that uh, gave us the kind of the the initial funds to produce. Um, uh, uh, we'll start making games, and we are. Um, currently looking to uh, partner with with uh, with a publisher, awesome. a publishing partner to uh, kind of finish our <laughs> our vision of what uh, we would like to make. Yeah. So can you can you say anything about like what genre you're kind of exploring or or anything like that, or is there a date that you're hoping to start announcing uh, what you're working on? Um, it's uh, we don't really talk about it at all um, because uh, it's an unannounced title. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's a strategic decision to do so. Like mm-hmm. basically, there's two ways of marketing an indie game, and one is announcing super early and kind mm-hmm. of building up, uh, um, you know, momentum and excitement. And another is to hold off on announcing so you can, uh, when you approach a publisher, um, they can uh, kind of help tailor the announcement better um since we don't really have an audience this is our first game we don't really have fans nobody knows who we are Mm -hmm. uh we figured it would be better if we held off on that and worked with a uh a partner that has like a greater reach Mm -hmm. for that uh, initial announcement yeah no that makes sense Uh, i feel like some people would see that as a as a negative you know not having an audience already but, but the way that you you word it is like some publishers out there are probably looking for people that aren't well known, you know, so that they can mm-hmm. kind of help package this whole experience, uh, which is really, really cool to hear. Um, do you have any any like dates or deadlines that you need to have this released by? Um, or is it, is it very much just like open right now? Uh, completely <laughs> um, under it? I think we're targeting early 2023. Okay, cool. Wow. Okay, awesome. Uh, great. Yeah, that's exciting. Um, and I, I can't wait to hear more about it. Um, I love secrets. Like I love, I love when people are holding onto things because, um, you know, especially what, what it looks like your, all your co-founders have incredible experience, uh, in the industry have been there for a while and have, you know, the skills and the knowledge of, of what the market looks like. Uh, so I'm really excited about that. So you were brought on as kind of the, um, it looks like the like studio management uh, like co-founder. Is that correct? Is that the kind of responsibilities that you you feel you have? That is correct. So my main responsibility are uh, business development, uh, project management, and studio management. So nice. I deal with lawyers. I deal with accountants, and I am also part of the the team that pitches the game to who uh, uh, to interested parties. Um, yeah. I also um do the kind of the regular project management stuff that you'd see in any game so you know like uh um task breakdowns and um you know uh timelines Mm -hmm. uh priorities etc yeah um can you i mean so we can kind of finish talking about cut to bits but talking about um ubisoft uh like i don't know how much of that is like under ndas but things like what tools you guys use there uh, is there any any of that that you you think you can share about like what kind of uh, project management uh, software you guys used at all? Um, yeah, I I don't I don't think I. <laughs> yeah, like Jira, uh, we use Jira. Very, yeah, yeah. It was we use Jira. I don't think I don't think that's under NDA. Um, no, everyone I've uses said it Jira, before. I've yeah, I, I've said it before, and I don't, I don't think it's like a particularly proprietary no. thing. Um, yeah I, yeah, I think they're pretty public about the fact that they are clients of at least in, so <laughs> yeah, no, totally. Um, awesome. So so yeah, like I you know i've 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 spent a lot of thought, um spent a lot of time thinking about best like processes during uh, in in my job as a production coordinator um, at Rocketworks in in Auckland, and that's just like a constant I feel like process and like getting better processes amongst your teams is just like a constant. Thing that you're working on uh, and i'd love to know from your experience like what what are some some like core uh, fundamentals for how to have like efficient teams that you've adopted that you you'll most likely take with you uh, on on the cut to bits um project um so like things for communication I, and 
so I think project management is uh, like deeply dependent on the on the team that you're managing. Mm -hmm. So I don't necessarily feel like it's like one of those things where I'm kind of like I started at point B, uh, point A, and then where I'm, you know, slowly progressing in my in my knowledge and mm. my uh, skills. It's more kind of like, um, it's kind of like chess almost. Hmm. You know how like when people learn chess, like uh, you know, they learn different moves. Like in under these circumstances, you do this. Under these circumstances, you do this. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like the project management is kind of like that. Like, I feel like over the years, I've learned to manage projects in different ways because of the needs of uh, teams are very different. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like the project management, manage, management needs of a team that's making like a large number of props is very different than like, uh, you know, the needs of a team that may, uh, makes character models, for example. Mm -hmm. Because like um, a prop prop making team is gonna make you know many many props in a single week, and uh, so really like um, and also those props usually uh, I mean depending on the um, depending on the on the type of game, but a lot of games have metrics as well. So mm -hmm. like it's gonna be kind of dependent on okay, so we. You know, we we start with a like uh, LD mockup saying like, okay, we need we need an objects about this about this size mm -hmm. and this part of them in the map, and then the level artist will come in and or modeler whoever um, will come in and say like, okay, well we can make a table, and then they make the table, and then you know the art director would give reference or. Yeah, they would decide that it's going to be a table. The art director will give the difference, saying like it should look like this. They model it; it gets integrated. Um, uh, maybe there's gameplay components, etc. So it yeah. kind of goes through a lot of people, and it's a large number of things that need to be keep track uh, that you need to keep track of. So like the needs are generally about like how do you how do you keep track keep track of a large number of items that are going to go through uh, a lot of hands. Yeah. And making sure that like all of these are cataloged correctly, whereas making characters, um, generally characters are modeled by one person, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, so it's something that like and and characters, especially in a you know high resolution game, like takes a long time. So like let's say you have one person that works on a a single character to like from like let's say six to eight weeks mm -hmm. and that work, one person is really just working on that for six to eight weeks and then hands it over to uh, a, a rigger depending on depending on the pipeline sometimes it's the same person and they will rig it and then they hand it over to the animators so those two needs are extremely different even though they're both you know within like the modeling art yeah. field and then if you start thinking about like you know what are the needs of programmers what are the needs of designers what are the needs of you know yeah you can't um, you can't just yeah like, one yeah blueprint on. yeah so you know i even on the same project like different parts of the project need to be man, uh, managed differently mm -hmm. and process needs to kind of follow that so yeah. if anything i think what i've learned is that like project management needs to serve <laughs> the process it fits uh a lot of times especially on larger projects like you get into a situation where like the producer wants to have like you know consistency so they'll mm. try to implement something that is like held across all the teams mm. and sometimes that works and sometimes that doesn't mm -hmm. um and i think that that kind of says a lot about like how i kind of go about project management like especially now that i'm managing a very small team um uh i want the process to be uh tailored to our 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 team well mm -hmm. like i don't want to impose what my preferences are onto the team although there is some level of that because like i chose jira because that's what i'm familiar with um even though like for a team, like even including like, you know, freelancers that help out, like we're, we're less than 10. Like there's no reason for us to have <laughs> uh, a tool that's as robust as Jira. Yeah. But 
again, it's familiarity and uh, comfort. So that's totally. kind of where it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I'm sorry, I kind of went on a tangent. No, that's uh, all really valuable does that stuff. Make sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and, and you're absolutely right. It's a great answer. I liked the kind of analogy of, of, of chess where it's like you could watch like different people playing the same game, but everyone's, you know, mentally doing different moves, like trying to solve different problems. Um, one problem from my experience that I, I find quite challenging is like cross department communication. And like when talking about mm -hmm. the art department, I feel like um, a project manager's responsibility can be getting, you know, whether it's design documents from the designers or uh, if something needs more functionality to kind of throw it back to the programmers. Do you have any, uh, any kind of ex thoughts about how to best help the communication between different departments. And I thought it was interesting how you mentioned some producers try to apply consistency across all departments and sometimes it doesn't work because of the needs. So what, what, is, what is your advice for when two different teams have like different processes and they kind of need to, like maybe one operates in sprints and one doesn't, um, how, how do you best make that communication uh, smooth? Um. I very, think very hard question. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very difficult, and again, it, broad, it really yeah. context uh, context dependent. But yeah. I think one of the things that I've noticed uh, helps a lot is to kind of have the bigger picture mm -hmm. um, in mind uh, and making sure that everybody knows what you're going towards. Because a lot of times people will just get a task, like mm -hmm. they get a Jira task saying, like you know, do x yeah and they do x um and they're like oh uh, somebody comes back and says like well the way you did it actually doesn't fit with what we needed mm -hmm. so you're gonna have to refactor it or you know the model that you did so i th i mean obviously this is very difficult on a larger team and if you have a lot of you know a lot of features and if you're on a deadline but like mm -hmm. to make sure that everybody knows what they're driving towards yeah you know, like to kind of, I, I guess user story is a really good kind of uh, reference point for this. Mm. Although, you know, like everything else, it's not perfect. Um, to Can you know what user stories, so it's, that's just like framing the question in a certain way, the task. Yeah. So use stories is like basically, okay. So before you come up with a feature, you have something that you're trying to achieve. Like what, what is the, like, what is the, you know, what is the player experience that this is serving? Mm -hmm. So like, for example, um, the user story could be something like, I would like to have a shotgun in this game. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, you have features that spawn from that, like there would be, or, you know, tasks that spawn from that. Mm -hmm. So one could be the, you know, the gameplay programmer needs to, you know, program the logic that would um, allow for the shotgun to function Mm -hmm. like a shotgun so you know the maybe it's a pump action so like you would uh you would have a pump let's say it's a pump action shotgun so you need to have functionality of uh pump loading mm -hmm. uh you have to you know calculate the spread of the mm -hmm. of the of the particles uh or the projectiles and um yeah yeah let's say that those are the things that you need to program on the programming side and then you have the animation to match that and then the models to match that and then you would have to have like a entry in the in the menu mm -hmm. to be able to select it uh etc yeah um all of so as long as everybody knows that uh that's uh the this i mean this is not a very good <laughs> user story because nobody's really going to be surprised about a shotgun <laughs> But um, actually, a better user story would, would be like, okay, so I want a shotgun in this game because I want something that is powerful, yeah. but slow. Yeah. And also kind of has a like, a, that you don't have to be very careful about aiming because mm -hmm. this, is, uh, this is the kind of, uh, you know, gameplay experience that I want mm -hmm. to contrast from like, you know, the, you know, the handguns and the, the, the rifles that we have in the game. Mm -hmm. So... If that is part of the user story, then like, you know, when you're programming the feature, you're going to be like, oh, okay, so obviously, like, I need I, this needs to be, uh, this needs to have a parameter that basically allows for, you know, the for the shotgun to be this kind of slow but like very powerful weapon, for yeah. example. 
Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, yeah, no, that's definitely, it's, it's good to rally people behind the, the intent of, of the item instead of just getting like a, a few words about what that thing is, but yeah. like why that thing is there is, is really important. That's what I think, yeah, user stories do a good job of is, is, is establishing that like intent. Um, mm-hmm. when, I, when I was researching you, I, I read a few of your LinkedIn recommendations and, and a lot of the people mentioned how much they trust you to deliver a project on time. And I'd love <laughs> to know, uh, like if you're working on a project or you could talk about a personal experience if you want, like when you're running behind schedule, what, uh, like what kind of actions do you take in order to get uh, the team back on schedule to deliver on time? Uh, like, I'd love to know what that like switches for you and, and what, how you kind of take action to, to solve that, uh, in the team? Um, if you're behind, you're already, you've already like, you, like you're at the wrong part of the game. Like if you're behind, there's not much you can do to pick, like get back up. Like generally game productions will go slower and slower. So like, you know, if you're two weeks behind, there's, there is absolutely zero chance that you'll be less than two weeks behind at the end of this cycle. Yeah. Um, the secret to being on time is one have buffers. So when you are two weeks behind, you are secretly still on time. Um, the other one is to also, uh, mitigate risk ahead of time. Uh, think about the entire pipeline. Think about the upstream and downstream risk of everything that your team needs to do. Like who are the thing, what, who are the people that need to deliver to you before you can deliver to somebody else? Um, what are their needs? Um, making sure that like uh, you're also prioritizing things that have a longer uh, longer tail. Like you know, if you have three tasks that you need to do this week, but you know that like one of the tasks that you need to hand over to another team uh, has like five days of work that need to be completed versus one day of work that needs to be completed after you're done then you need to prioritize the thing that needs to be done or the the five day task first. Like all of this is kind of like sounds obvious, but um, all of this really uh, adds up. I think it's very important um, in video game production to know that you are part of the machine. Mm -hmm. You, and while your needs and your team needs are important, like, uh, you are there to serve a greater function and, um, and knowing how you fit into that machine, um, makes you better at, uh, delivering on time because you will be making, uh, decisions that are, that are in line with, uh, what, you know, what it has greater risk. Yeah. Another aspect is also clearly communicating. hmm um, I, um, I think that one of the, you know, one of the things that really makes a difference when you're, when you're talking to, you know, other, other developers and other teams is like, for example, um, a lot of times why things get delayed is because the teams upstream are late mm-hmm. and, um, like, let's say the game designers th- that need to give you, you know, you're making guns and you need the specifications from the guns or for the guns uh, uh, at, at a certain date to make sure that everything needs to deliver on time. Yeah. Well, if you want to do that, you have to make sure that the people who uh, are upstream from you also know your constraints mm-hmm. and be very transparent with them. A lot of people are kind of used to, you know, being saddlebags, so they don't necessarily take your dates seriously. Mm-hmm. But if you tell them, like, look, you know, uh, our no nonsense cutoff drop dead date is this day, because mm-hmm. you know, and then you also explain to them, like, okay, so modeling this gun is going to take five days, and then you're going to like, uh, and then we're going to have to like rig it and then animate it, and like all of these cumulatively kind of in a Gantt chart kind of perspective, like is all going to take three weeks. So mm-hmm. if you don't do, uh, you know, if we don't get your design three weeks before the, you know, the content lock, then this, this gun is not going to make it. Yeah. And that's going to be on you. Yeah. And if you 
communicate like that, then they are much more likely to be on time and therefore you're also on time because mm -hmm. you're not starting late. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, no, communication is, is really important. Uh, you mentioned like a, like a buffer is really important earlier. Do you have like any um, hard and fast rule of like when someone gives you uh, like a scope of how long a task will take, you just like slap on 20% or 30%? Do you have like a, like a number that you kind of go to to give yourself that buffer? Uh, it depends on how risky the asset is. Like mm -hmm. um, something that you've done a million times, uh, I say... You should add 20 percent too yeah uh, because you should never have less than 20 percent buffer um uh some you know programming features i would say a buffer of 100 percent is fairly reasonable <laughs> so you know that's true that's true you know if a if if a programmer tells you they're gonna it's gonna take you one week to do it like assume that it's gonna take two yeah yeah, and it's not even a joke I, I either. Think, like that. no, and and I'm not being flippant. Like yeah, and I'm not saying that programmers are lazy or they don't no. know how to estimate. It's just that it's extremely difficult to estimate mm. programming tasks. <laughs> totally. Yeah, because a lot of times you don't really even know um, how difficult something is going to be until they start. Because mm -hmm. you know you start poking in. And, or like you know when it ends, like you know like I I've definitely had programmers that I was managing tell me like they have a five-day task um and four days into it they're like yeah no I'm on time like everything everything looks good I'm pretty sure I'm gonna finish tomorrow and then day five rolls out and they're like another two weeks. yeah every everything <laughs> everything is now going wrong yeah. I think it's gonna take me another week so yeah Totally. Um, no, that's, that's, that's it. Is that's, what it is. That's, that's, that's exactly right. And um, and anyone who who tries to stick to that like initial scope is is um uh, is always gonna gonna be behind. So I think having that buffer in mind for any any producer is um is important. So and I think that's why also working through priorities is important. Like you start yeah. with high priority and you work through low priority because chances yeah. are you're gonna run out of time. Yeah. And if you um let people work on like low priority stuff first, or you know, then you've now jeopardized the game. So yeah. totally. Yeah. I think if every game ships with you know hundreds or thousands of bugs in the backlog that uh, that haven't been addressed. I think that's that's another fact of game development as well as you you'll never have time to to get to everything uh, that you wanted. So yeah, prioritization yeah, and, is really important. And features and a number of features that get cut because mm -hmm. of time is you know it's normal. Like no, nobody ever games are never done. Yeah, I, what's the expression? Like games are never done; they're just abandoned. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Um, awesome. So I'd love to talk a bit about uh, like your kind of journey into games and, and what got you initially into games. So you, you're originally Japanese. Were you, were you born in Japan? Yes, um, I was born and raised in Japan. I lived in Japan until I was 15 years old. I wow. moved to California. Uh, so my mother is American. And my so I have uh, relatives in California. And I went to live with my grandparents to go to high school. And, and then I went to university uh in california and yeah that's that's why i was in california um mm -hmm. i started in video games because it was kind of a, a total coincidence i never thought i would work in video games i never really i mean i never but uh, did mean, you play a lot I of never, games as a kid i i did play games as, as a kid um i i was born in 1980 Mm -hmm. So when I was four years old, the NES came out in Japan. Nice. So like video games have really, has really been a part of my life since, um, well, as far as, uh, as back, as far back as I can remember. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Nintendo was huge in Japan, like in the eighties, uh, you know, like it's, it's the, <laughs> It's where Nintendo is, and their mm -hmm. their presence there is quite uh, mm. quite profound. Like you know, and yeah, I I grew up playing video games, and um, I never really thought that I would work in video games. It wasn't even something that I that I wanted to do because, I mean, I'm not a programmer. I'm not an artist. Like I never, you know, 
it just didn't seem like one of the options. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened was when I graduated university, I studied political science and um, there are not a lot of jobs for uh, graduates of political science. Like they're not, <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a hugely in-demand uh, field mm -hmm. for the most part. Um, I contemplated going to law school because uh, people that I knew uh, that were in political science and other, you know, uh, social studies, uh, the social sciences uh, went, um, went into law, but they, I don't know, law school seemed miserable. Um, friends that I had that were lawyers didn't like being lawyers. So I was like, maybe not. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't really know what to do. And the only marketable skill I had was the fact that I was bilingual Japanese to English mm -hmm. and that I had done some uh, volunteer interpreting at anime conventions nice. uh, while I was in college. So I was like, oh, well, I mean, maybe that's something I can do. And I had a couple of jobs. Uh, I had a couple of temp jobs. Uh, that required me to be, you know, bilingual, uh, doing office work. And uh, a friend of mine told me that, hey, like uh, Ubisoft is looking for a localization expert. And wow, um, it was a, it was a, <laughs> it was a Craigslist ad. And I sent my resume and cover letter. I went and talked to my cousin because uh, I didn't really even know how to write a resume. So. Um, yeah, I, I talked to my cousin and he showed me how, you know, he, we wrote my resume together and my cover letter together. And uh, yeah, like I sent it to Ubisoft. They got, they got back to me and- um, It's this history. Yeah, I <laughs> started Ubisoft in 2006, April 1st of 2006 was my yeah. first day. So, so after working in, in kind of localization for a while, um, did you did you start to kind of look over your shoulder at the different departments as you got got kind of familiar with the the game development process? What was that like, and what what kind of led you to leave localization? Because you went to community management after that, is that right? Um, um, no, was it was actually a little more complicated. <laughs> uh, so I never worked in localization per se. So I uh, I worked for third party uh, publishing. Mm -hmm. So that was the department. Uh, in San Francisco that would take uh, games made by other companies and they would uh, Ubisoft publish it hmm. um, for for North America. And wow. so uh, there were third party producers that uh, worked in San Francisco that spoke English and they were dealing with Japanese developers uh, because they were taking Japanese games and um, hmm. marketing it to uh, the Western Mm -hmm. western market so yeah like that's kind of what my job was um mm -hmm. some of it was translation but i did very little like actual translation mm -hmm. uh per se i did a little bit of menus but most of my translation was um yeah and most of the translation was uh uh handled by third part uh like uh, outside um right. uh translation services i'm assuming i yeah. I, I wasn't really part of that but uh um yeah, it was mostly the communication between the between the the team in San Francisco with the different uh, different Japanese developers. Yeah, and I never really had a chance to really get used to that because that was in April, and a couple months later, I got um, uh, somebody from Montreal reached out saying that they were making a um, a game of the Japanese cartoon and comic book Naruto. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and they Huge. needed a Japanese person. <laughs> wow. <laughs> because, just that they just uh, needed someone, a Japanese person. Uh, basically, uh, they needed someone who was going to be the, the go-between <laughs> with the, the team making the video game in Montreal and the rights holder in Tokyo. Gotcha. Because, because it's a licensed title, they had to you know, get the licensor to approve <laughs> the game and that there was a... Um, so my job was to basically translate uh, various game content and present all of that to the licensors in Japan. Mm -hmm. So that was TV Tokyo, who owned the rights to the anime, mm -hmm. and Shueisha, uh, who owns the uh, who owned the rights to the comic book. Mm 
Wow. And basically they would say like, oh, uh, uh, you know, they would see a game design document saying like, okay, that, that makes sense or that doesn't make sense. And they would see, uh, they would see printouts of, of, um, you know, different characters that were modeling and they say, oh, well, their face needs to be slimmer or, Mm -hmm. uh, I think the color on their, you know, on their sash is a, uh, is the wrong color. Make sure that you're, you know, Mm -hmm. checking the reference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like that. That's fascinating. Yeah. So I did that on two games. So that was, that was about two and a half years. So I worked in production kind of as this like uh, license. Uh, my job was license coordinator mm-hmm. on that, and yeah, that that was that was what I did. I dealt with kind of the back and forth. Nice. Um, and then after that, uh, I had a year of that was I was in kind of limbo. Um, <laughs> I was an assistant, a couple of executive producers, because uh, at that point I was really interested in going into production management. So, um, yeah, that's that was my intention. But like, basically, a few things happened, and uh, that didn't really work out. Mm-hmm. Um, and and then, what was I it ended like in community management? <laughs> what, what was it like being an executive assistant? Would you uh, would you recommend that role? Like, what what kind of responsibilities were were in that? Um, well, I I, I guess it depends it, as well. What yeah, it depends on what you do. Yeah. I did mostly research. Yeah. So okay. basically, um, yeah, they would tell me, "Hey, like, can you look at like sales figures in this type of game in mm. these regions?" And I would, you know, write reports. Mm-hmm. Uh, they uh, they would ask me. Um, uh, this was around the time that like Facebook games were really big, so they they would, I would, uh, they told me like, "Okay, so uh, look at all the major Facebook games." Um, and uh, come back to me with like how their business model works, how their recruitment model works, how like their their gameplay cycle works, how does how is it monetized, etc. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I would write a report, and they would read it and say, "Okay, can you can you give me more of this or that?" Yeah. Okay. Um. So I, I mean, it was interesting experience i'm not <laughs> yeah I, it's not I, something i would recommend or not recommend but it's not a i don't think it's it's not a very uh common position within the games industry either so yeah i think you've had an, an incredible amount of just like different tastes of of what kind of positions exist in in some of these big studios do you have ambitions to to kind of build a studio that big that has all these all these different kinds of employees or, or has that experience made you want to keep it keep it small and and close knit um i think i was extremely fortunate so just to kind of round out the Mm -hmm. rest of the stuff that i did (laughs) yeah so after that there was basically two positions that i i had one was that um uh i was the lead community developer for montreal so i managed uh people who were working in social media on different titles for Montreal. So wow. like there were people that were assigned to Assassin's Creed. There were people assigned to Watch Dogs, Far Cry, et cetera. I managed Amazing. them to kind of like, you know, uh, standardize procedures, kind of help them when they needed it, uh, recruit and train them, et cetera. Uh, and then after that, I worked in, I got into production management and then, um, yeah, I, I did technically, I was a production coordinator, a team lead and a production manager, but like, they're all kind of the same yeah, job. It's just kind of, uh, it's just a question of scale. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that's that's what I did. Um, uh, in terms of, do I want a studio that big? Not really, but not necessarily because I'm because of my experience. I just don't want to have a large studio. Like, well, and it's not just me. Like, mm. uh. Like our our studio is extremely flat. Like my job is to manage things, but I'm not I'm not in charge of mm-hmm. the studio per se. Like we we collectively uh, you know discuss where we want to go and um, you know kind of we form strategies together. Uh, but um, we're not really interested in making 
cut to bits into like a giant triple A studio. We want to, we want to continue to make fun games that we enjoy making. And yeah. yeah, that's, that's kind of our objective. Um, yeah, we, I, for us, it's more fun to make a game with a smaller team. So that's kind yeah. of what our priorities are at the moment. Yeah. Um, going back to your experience as like a team lead and, and production manager, and, and I guess now at Cut to Bits, do you feel like there's a, a size of uh, like how many people do you feel comfortable managing per se? I know it's a very quite, quite like flat structure. So maybe going back to, to Ubisoft, like, do you think if you're managing a team of, of uh, like 20 plus people that, that there is like a limit before it, it doesn't become as efficient? Like, do you think there's a, a sweet spot or a, a good number of people that you think one person should be responsible for in, in, te- in a team? Um, I think it really depends on how, how responsible you are with these individual people. Mm. Like, um, I think if you are kind of like, the full manager of, of a person. Like, so not only are you doing the daily tasking, you're doing like the, you know, you're, uh, you're the full on manager for, for that person. Um, it requires a lot of empathy and time. Mm. So like, is it possible to manage a team of 20 people? Yes. Is it possible to manage a team of 20 people and do them justice, I don't think it's possible. Mm. I think um, it also depends on like kind of the, you know, the the structure as well. Like, you know, in a larger company that has like uh, HR support and, you know, IT support and all of that stuff that just kind of gets handled, then mm. like it is possible to, large, uh, you know, manage a larger team than if, you know, it's a smaller indie team. And then you also have to worry about things like license, like actual going out and getting actual licenses for, Mm -hmm. um, for, uh, for the tools that you use and, you know, having to negotiate for like, you know, any kind of training that everybody needs instead of just making a request to the training team. (laughs) Yeah. Then, yeah, that's a factor, but I think, um, managing 10 people is a lot. Mm. caring about 10 people is i mean i is i i don't know i think beyond 10 it's hard to like individually care about them yeah no i I really because uh, like and i'm not saying that people don't care about it but like to like to genuinely care about like people's careers and like their needs and their emotional health like mm -hmm. All of that is very difficult to do the larger the team gets. And I think 10 for me is kind of a cutoff where yeah. beyond that, I, you know, I just, I'm physically and emotionally exhausted. Totally. I think it's a really good uh, uh, point to make. And I think empathy, uh, what you mentioned was, is, is the key to it because you really, you know, as, as an employee or as a, as a team, you want to feel like you are being taken care of and everyone goes through different like troubles that at different times whether it's um a breakup or you know a vaccine treatment and they you know they need someone to like talk to that they can trust and to build that trust yeah you really need to to spend the time to um to talk to that person i I think 10 is a is a good number as well i think that's a, a a fair um time to just give yeah make give justice to to each person as a human to actually care about what what they're going through in their lives um awesome yeah thanks for thanks for touching on that uh i'd love to to ask you so you've got a your own podcast um and i'd love to know (laughs) about um what what some of the main because your your podcast is all about um talking to people about what they do outside of games and i'd love to know a few of the like like things that you've taken away uh that i don't know a few of, of, of the 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 things that come to mind when you think of your podcast, like the main takeaways of what people do outside games that like fascinated you that you'd like to share. Um, Yeah. To give your podcast a little plug. Um, So my podcast is called what else do you do? And I interview game devs about what they do when they're not making video games. Um, The reason I ended up with this podcast was I wanted to do, I wanted to interview game devs. I knew that um and i wanted to do something that was kind of unusual because you know i didn't want to make another podcast about you know 
uh, deep dive into game design or, you know, what is the, you know, what is the game that you wish you were on? Not that there's anything wrong with these podcasts. It's just that there's, there's already a lot of them out there and I wanted to do something different. Um, Mm -hmm. I also didn't want to, I also wanted to focus on the fact that like game devs are people like it's even within the industry. I think people focus on like, what do you do? Uh, What, you know, what games have you worked on? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's when you meet game devs, you, you end up talking about game dev a lot, you know, like, what is it like to go? uh, What is it like over in your studio? What is Mm -hmm. it like over on your game? You know, what's, you know, what's going well, what's not going well, you know, do you like working with this person or that person? And I want to take a break from that. Um, and I also, nice. it was during the the pandemic and I needed, I, I needed more interaction with people that I didn't know because mm-hmm. I was getting to the point where I was talking to the same five people over and over and over again. And um, yeah, I just needed more novelty. Yeah. So I thought it would be a fun thing to do. And I also thought it would be easy to get people to talk about something that they're passionate about. Yeah. So yeah, that's kind of how that podcast kind of came to be. Yeah. What's one thing that you've learned from, from one of your guests that, that made you, you know, think about, cause I mean, yeah, game devs, a lot of them just get sucked into the games that they're making and, you know, they get um, during crunch and they, they suffer from burnout. Like what's, what's one, one thing that you learned that other people listening could maybe take up uh, as a hobby or, or something uh, to, to take them away from games for a while? Um, well, I mean, you should do what you want to do. I think everyone is different and everybody's going to want to do different things, but you should take the time to do it. You know, saying that you're too busy or you don't have the time or you don't have the energy to do something like, you know, this is your life. Like you're not going to get less t- you're not going to get more time. You're not going to get less busy. Like you, you do need to make time for yourself, you know, Mm -hmm. like, um, and I think the reoccurring themes is like how, how much it's important psychologically and, and, and in terms of mental health, you know, we are not robots. We, we, we can't just like go work, work, work. You know, we, we do need to take time for ourselves and we do need to take, time to kind of disconnect from you know our nine to five job because it's just not healthy to not do that Mm. yeah no that's that's a really yeah powerful thing i think when it comes to like mental health and work life hobby balance um uh, that is that is really good so um i definitely especially for game developers so i i encourage anyone (laughs) who who does feel like they haven't really got a, a nice healthy if they're like you know constantly stressed or uh, feeling like they're overworked to uh, maybe go listen to a few episodes of the uh, what else what else do you do uh, podcast yeah. um, and and see if anything there inspires you um, but uh, but yeah that's yeah well, I, I think there's already 38 episodes out there so amazing. there's there's a lot of different things that people are doing everything from horseback riding to professional wrestling to I love you it. know what do you do uh, drag queens like ton, tons of stuff yeah. So. What, what's, what's one thing that you do outside that, um, you know, that you like to, to do on a, on a day off and, um, that you like to, to build up? What, what, what is that thing that you do? I, I do all kinds of stuff. Um, I, I, but, um, right now I, I'm, uh, sewing a patch onto my jacket, nice. uh, a denim jacket, like, and the patch is like this big, so it's oh, uh, nice. it's <laughs> um, hand sewing that. So that's kind of fun. Um, another thing I like to do is like sharpening knives. Uh, you know, oh. uh, I I like to kind of make things. Uh, um, like uh, I made an end table for nice. the like a small table over there. You can't see it; it's off the screen. But because <laughs> uh, we needed a little table for the modem and the router, yeah. so I cut up a pallet. Yeah. Um, and made a table. Um, <laughs> that's awesome. I don't know. I'm, I'm always up to kind of nonsense. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, my wife's in a, in a, like a home reno mood at the moment. And, um, yeah, like every, especially like the, the more time we spend in, in lockdown and in, in New Zealand, the, um, the more crazy ideas we, we think of, um, just decorating, de- decorating different <laughs> rooms, getting different colors and, um, different projects which is yeah it's a great way to keep you busy That's and keep, cool keep your body yeah. active 
Um, um, awesome. Although I do miss dancing. I wish that I could, I could, I could dance, but alas, uh, with COVID, it's uh, quite difficult. Yeah. Have you tried to attend any like virtual, virtual dance classes um, or like over Zoom? I've seen a few. Uh, like, I have not. <laughs> um, so um, I, I've had quite a bit of a blank, but uh, I used to dance the tango. Oh, cool. And nice. um, I was contemplating getting back into the tango uh, a couple of years ago, and then COVID happened. Yeah. So, yeah, I've been kind of like waiting for all of this to settle down so I could go back to dancing tango. And tango is very like contact, uh, like, like contact is a really important part of the, the dance. So I'm not, and especially since I'm getting back into it, I'm not sure if I can really do it remotely, but uh, one yeah. day I'm hoping. Yeah, I hope. Well, I hope there is a day that we see tango coming back, and this isn't the new normal where tango, you know, falls. I saw a headline that was like suits, suit, uh, suits are declining, uh, suit, suit sales are declining. No one's buying suits anymore, and it's just like weird uh, things like that that I think, you know, are, sh are changing the the industry now because people are just getting comfortable with with what they're wearing. Um, but yeah, I oh. hope I hope that you're able to uh, to do some tango uh, sometime in the in the near future. Um, thank you yeah uh well thank you so much for your time that's that's kind of all we all we've got uh time for but uh but i appreciate you sharing uh you know your knowledge how you got into the industry i guess one last question that i want to ask is uh you, you've had like a very uh you know interesting path into games but but i'm sure you've you know talked to a lot of developers and working at, at ubisoft i'm sure a lot of people ask you like how they can get into the industry like what's what's one piece of advice you'd give for for someone wanting to pursue game dev it's, it's you know this a lot of the things we've spoken about is very context dependent uh depending on what the skills are but is there one piece of advice that you'd like to give to the people just to help them maybe get their next opportunity in games um be employable and i i know that sounds kind of obvious <laughs> but it's not necessarily um you know you got to remember that the the people who are doing the hiring don't really care about where you're coming from like mm -hmm. they are trying to solve a problem and there's their problem they need to solve is that they need somebody that can do x um so whatever it is that you need to do you need to be that person that can solve that problem for them and it doesn't necessarily like you know and there's a lot of different kinds of employable person in the video games. I was a translator. Uh, there are accountants, there are mm -hmm. lawyers, there are, you know, project managers, there are programmers, you know, but whatever you do, you need to be able to demonstrate that you can do the job. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there are internships and there are opportunities for people to learn how to do the job on, on the, on, on the job training, but um, those positions are fairly few and far between. So, mm. you know, get involved in those dev jams, get involved in, uh, making a, you know, a amateur, uh, a game with your, with other people who are trying to get into the industry. Like mm -hmm. you need to be able to demonstrate that you can do the job. So start making games, like start making games right now. If that's what you want to do, figure it out, figure out what you can do to make games, figure out find people that can make games with you and then do it. Mm -hmm. That's the only way you're going to, you're going to get anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. No, great, great piece of advice. Be employable. Uh, I love it. Yeah. Thank you so much for your, <laughs> for your time. Um, uh, and if anyone's interested in, in following um, Masao's journey, you can find him on Twitter at uh, Mega Masao, which is M-E-G-A-M-A-S-A-O. Uh, you can also go to the, um, his indie studio's website, cuttobits.com. It's quite bare at the moment, but I'm sure in the near future. <laughs> it's not much there, but uh, there will eventually be something there. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm really excited to hear about this unannounced project and uh, what publishers you have on board and, and that kind of thing. So all the best with that journey. And, um, and I look forward to seeing how that develops. Uh, so thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Zero to Play podcast. I hope you learned something about game development, the games industry as a whole, or the future of games. You can follow us on Twitter at zero to play subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on Spotify, or any other podcasting service. Other than that, you can find links to this episode down in the description below, and I'll see you guys next week for the next episode.